Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. There was a a woman named Egeria who went to Jerusalem in the 80s. Not the 1980s, the 380s, 380 from Spain to Jerusalem. And she kept a record, a journal, an account of her visit. And she wrote about what the church in Jerusalem did on Palm Sunday. Egeria writes this. As the eleventh hour approaches, the passage from the gospel is read, where the children, carrying branches and palms, met the Lord, saying, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And the bishop immediately rises, and all the people with him, and they all go on foot from the top of the Mount of Olives, all the people going before him with hymns and antiphons, answering one to another, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And all the children in the neighborhood, even those who are too young to walk, are carried by their parents on their shoulders, all of them bearing branches, some of palms and some of olives, and thus the bishop is escorted in the same manner as the Lord was of old. Today, we walk in those same steps, carrying on the same tradition that has continued ever since Jesus went into Jerusalem in triumph. And as we consider the story, I have three points. David, the donkey, and the dance. King David, the donkey, and the dance. So first, King David. We'll notice what the crowd says as they come to meet Jesus. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now, Hosanna is an Aramaic phrase that means save us. And in prior years, I focused my sermon on that word. But this year, I want to notice another detail here, which is this. The opening phrase, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, this is a quotation from Psalm 118. It's a direct quotation from the scriptures. And the people, knowing the Psalms, use it and cry out. But here's the interesting fact. The people added another phrase to it, the last part, even the king of Israel. That phrase, even the king of Israel, is not in Psalm 118. We see it in other parts of the Bible. But the crowd was excited. It was exuberant, and it proclaimed an additional detail that this man, Jesus, coming back to the city of Jerusalem, coming to save them, was the returning king. For those of you who are aficionados of Tolkien, as you know I am, it was the return of the king, the rightful one, the long-awaited Messiah, the long-prophesied, now come back to the city in triumph to set everything to rights. But what you need to understand is that such a proclamation that this Jesus was the returning king was deeply political, even military in character. For it was only a few centuries before this, during the Maccabean revolt, that the Israelites had thrown off their previous conquerors, waving palms in triumphant procession as they reestablished an Israelite throne. And so the people gathered with palms, crying out, 
the king of Israel, in the belief that Jesus would come to save them from the Romans. The Romans who controlled the city, the Romans who levied a tax, the Romans who governed, who went in or out. They hoped that Jesus would come to save them from their political enemies. And so Jesus decides to make a point of his own. It's very interesting, actually. It's unique to the Gospel of John. In, in the other Gospels, the details about the donkey are developed first, before the procession. But here in John, you see the details of the procession, and then it says, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. And that's our second point. He is the returning David, but now he's riding on a donkey. Take a look with me at the image on the front of the bulletin. And uh, Keith, can you give us the close-up? What do you notice? Yeah, Jesus is smiling. He's enjoying the moment. Crowd, many of whom are smiling. Some are singing. Palms. Right. What's he riding? Donkey. Now, uh, our artist, Henry Munyaneza, who's been making art uh, through this series of the Gospel of John, uh, has a typical practice, which is each week, as we are coming up to the passage, I give him the, the Bible passage, and I make a few notes of what I'd like him to include in the image. And in this case, I said, you know, have Jesus coming in. I, I'd like to see children. I'd like to see him kind of interacting with them, singing, and a smile on his face. And Henry does a great job, and he sent me a sketch of the image. And in the first sketch, Jesus was riding a large steed. And I said, you know, this is a great sketch, but there's one problem. He needs to be on a donkey. And you know, it actually brought him down in the composition, closer to the people. Before he was high up, the conquering king. Now, as you can see, you see the child on the parent's shoulders in the far left? Now children being carried aloft on shoulders can be at the same level as Jesus. Of course, we don't have a description of that in the Bible, but I do wonder, I mean, in Jerusalem, that's what they did in the early centuries after Jesus. Maybe that's a memory of that day. There Jesus was humble, as the prophecy says in Zechariah riding on a donkey. So he comes as the king, yes, the returning king of Israel, and yet he comes not as a military hero. I want to notice something else about this donkey. It's pretty interesting detail. A young donkey, it says, and in the prophecy, it's a donkey's colt. So just a year or two old. At this stage, donkeys often would not yet be trained to ride. Now, some of you have experience with this, or perhaps you've seen it in Friends or um, in movies. What happens when you go to a horse or a donkey who has not yet been ridden? Does that horse or donkey just very placidly go along with you, allow you to ride, to go into a parade? That horse or that donkey is going to buck. It's going to run away, right? Well, the Bible has an explanation for that. It actually comes from Genesis chapter 9. And this is God speaking to Noah after the flood when he's reestablishing his covenant with uh, Noah. And he says this, 
be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, the fear and dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. You see what that means? It was only after Noah that animals were afraid of man. You ever wonder how it was that Adam was able to name all the animals in the garden? They weren't afraid of him. They came up and he had some kind of interaction, conversation, naming them. They didn't run away. They knew him and he knew them. And so you see, Jesus is not only the returning king of Israel. He's also the returning king of Eden. He's the new Adam. He's the one who comes with communion in the whole natural world. Even the donkey, the young donkey, the cult of a donkey, will receive him, will not buck at his touch. That donkey will even carry him through a crowd with song and palms. Because Jesus is the returning king of all creation. And that's what we read about in the Psalms. Psalm 149, Psalm 96, elsewhere. Right? This is what happens when God returns. When the king, the true king, returns, everything, all creation, responds with joy. And so the third point is the dance. David, the donkey, and the dance. Praise the Lord, Psalm 149 says. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. You see, the response of the people to the returning king is to dance. Just as David danced at the return of his king, God, in the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, so the people come out and join in the parade. They join in the dance. Now, you know that in order to dance, you have to learn the steps. And so to walk with Jesus through Holy Week is to learn the steps of the dance. It's the dance established by God for his people of what it means to be human. There's many moves in this dance. There are the steps of joy and exaltation. The steps of righteous holiness in the temple. The steps of listening and receiving as Jesus teaches. The steps of communing with him on Monday Thursday. The steps of temptation and suffering with him in Gethsemane. And finally, the steps of self-sacrifice on the cross. And you see, Jesus is the returning Adam, the true man. He is the shape of... He gives us the shape. He gives us the steps of what it means to flourish. And so as we follow him this Holy Week, we learn those steps. We learn what it means to be our true selves. And I want to close with this question. You know, whenever we think about Palm Sunday, we usually imagine ourselves in the crowd there with Jesus as he comes into the city, waving the palms as we did today. But let me ask this, what 
would it be like if we were not the crowd, but rather we were the donkey? How would you feel if Jesus came to you? Would you buck? Maybe a little bit. But this is the true king. Not a political and military ruler who rules only by force. This is the returning Adam. The one who knows all creation. The one who knows you because he made you. And so when he comes and he says, will you carry me? Will you take me for the dance? How will you respond? Jesus comes to each one of us today and he says, come with me. Follow after me. Walk with me. Carry me. And I will save you and make you into the person you were meant to be. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.